welcome to the uh, Rio Grande pre-forum webinar. Today we're in for a special treat. We have two hydrologists who are going to present on their work on the Rio Grande. Uh, today's webinar is being brought to you by the South Central Climate Science Center, the World Wildlife Fund, good folks at Coca-Cola, the um, uh, and numerous other um, groups. Too many for my memory to recount. So our speakers today are Dr. Jack Schmidt at the University, oh, at, excuse me, at, Uni at Utah State University, and Dr. Sam Sandoval Salas at UC Davis. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Jack Schmidt. Jack? Uh, thank you. Um, the Rio Grande, Rio Bravo is obviously one of the two great rivers of Western North America that we share. Uh, the United States and Mexico share management of these two rivers. The um, river um, is not only a very long river from its headwaters in southern southwestern Colorado, but it um, is also was once a prodigious carrier of fine sediment with one of the largest um, sediment loads delivered to the sea. Uh, for purposes of this talk, we distinguish three parts of the watershed. The northern branch of the Rio Grande, the Rio Conchos, and the lower Rio Grande downstream from the confluence of these two headwater branches. I'm going to talk about our work on the northern branch. Sam Solis, Sam Sandoval Solis is going to talk about the Rio Conchos and implications for further downstream. As we all know, uh, humans have altered the natural stream flow of the northern branch for centuries. In the late 1500s and uh, early 1600s, uh, diversions were observed and installed uh, by early Spanish uh, uh, colonists to the region. Uh, after the reconquest, uh, and reasserting of Spanish control of the area in the 1700s, irrigation expanded uh, in the lower downstream end of the watershed as well as expanding in the upstream part of the northern branch as well as near the Presidio at the confluence of the Rio Conchos and the northern branch. In 1848, this uh, this area became part of the United States after the Mexican-American War, and most importantly, extensive irrigation began in the San Luis Valley of south-central south Colorado. And in fact, by 1890, there was substantially more irrigated land here than in all of New Mexico, despite the centuries of uh, irrigate, history of irrigation in New Mexico. <clears throat> By the late 1800s, there had been significant hydrologic and channel changes throughout the northern branch. New Mexico complained to Colorado of a loss of summer base flow. The geomorphology was changing because the stream flows were cut off, but sediments still entered the river. Floodplain soils were becoming waterlogged. And further downstream, Mexico formally complained about ir inadequate irrigation supplies in Juarez and on the Mexican side of the river. The 1906 convention was signed and large dams were completed on the Rio Conchos 
and Elephant Butte Dam in, the, in southern New Mexico. The reservoirs on each of, behind each of these dams was approximately the same storage, somewhat over two million acre feet of water behind each of these dams. The oldest stream gauge in the United States, established by the U.S. Geological Survey, is the Rio Grande at Embudo, New Mexico. The oldest gauge in the United States is on the Rio Grande. And it was established there to begin to measure the effects of irrigation development and what was the nature of the depleted stream flows in this contested area of water supply. Thus, when we look at the characteristics of the stream flow, in the earliest records, they nevertheless are a regime that is perturbed. What I've shown here, roughly scaled by the width of the lines, is the mean annual flow at each of the gauges that operated Del Norte, Imbuto, Ottawa Bridge, El Paso, uh, near Presidio. And what you can see is a slight increase in stream flow, and then a slight depletion, and then a substantial depletion between El Paso and Presidio associated with irrigation depletions in the El Paso Juarez Valley. And so the challenge here is that even the oldest records record the impact of human society's use of water. But we learn so much more by looking at how the total annual flow was perturbed by water development. In white is the average hydrograph of the flood in the northern branch before completion of Elephant Butte Dam. And you can see the passage of the snowmelt flood from the Colorado Rockies between April and July. Once Elephant Butte Dam was completed, releases were evened out during the year and then nearly entirely diverted onto farm fields in southern New Mexico and the El Paso Juarez Valley such that the amount of water arriving at the confluence with the Rio Conchos was drastically reduced from white to these values for different decades that I've shown. So you can see that the flow regime of the actual river is tremendously changed um, by the existence of Elephant Butte and the expansion of um, consumptive water use. If we summarize the annual flows, we have this sort of picture, which I think is an important mental uh, image to have of the river in the early part of the 20th century and the river today. You can see that in the beginning, before Elephant Butte, more water arrived at Presidio from the Rio Conchos than arrived from the northern branch. And you can tell that in the 1930s, the disparity was even greater such that the flow through the Big Bend region essentially was mostly coming from Mexico. Expanded use of water and drought in Chihuahua has decreased the delivery of water out of Mexico, but um, you can see that effectively the hydrology of the upper parts of the northern branch have relatively little to do with the stream flow of the lower Rio Grande. Thus, the Rio Grande just upstream from the Rio Conchos in an area called the Forgotten Reach, today is a discontinuous, narrow channel completely choked by tamarisk and other invasive plants. It's impossible to navigate. 
and a once wide sandy river looks nothing like that today. This is the Rio Grande, the northern branch of the Rio Grande near Presidio. This is the confluence of the northern Rio branch, the northern branch of the river with the Rio Conchos going downstream. This is La Junta de los Rios. This is the confluence of the Rio Conchos and the northern branch today. When we go back this last slide and we look at the characteristics of the flow measured before La Boquilla and Elephant Butte were com completed, in red is the average hydrograph of the northern branch just as that water arrived at Presidio. And in black is the, hydro is the average hydrograph of the Rio Grande further downstream. The difference between red and black is the contribution from the Rio Conchos. So the question becomes, this is the best we have for measurements. How might this compare with the characteristics of the natural flow regime before any extensive irrigation? We ought to remember that the native aquatic ecosystems and native riparian vegetation are partly affected by the stream flow regime, the sediments transported by the flows, how these two factors create the geomorphology of the channel and floodplain and thereby affect the uh, habitats of native organisms. <laughs> And water development that has been extensive in the basin that directly affects the amount and timing of stream flow directly affects these native organisms, but also indirectly through, through the construction of dams affects the sediment supplies, allows non-native vegetation to invade, primarily tamarisk and arundo. Associated with increased agriculture is the construction of levees, and sometimes water development goes hand in hand with the introduction of exotic fish that are predators and competitors to the native ecosystems. So we might, if, if our goal is to environmentally manage the native ecosystems of the uh, Rio Grande, we might want to know what is the river of old, before large scale changes to the ecosystem, what was that river like that the native ecosystem evolved in and how different is it from today when we talk about simple words like restoration? And so to do so, Todd Blythe, a wonderful grad student working with me who's sitting here with me embarked on an effort to estimate what we call the natural flow of the river. The natural flow regime in the absence of significant human activity, the flow regime in which the native river ecosystem evolved. To do that, Todd acquired and analyzed all of the gauging records of all the inflows of the entire northern branch watershed, all of the smaller tributaries, and then came up with strategies to estimate other ungaged inflows, and then assumed that existing losses associated with present irrigation uh, did not exist. To illustrate that, at the far upstream end of the watershed in blue is the hydrograph for one particular year of the Rio Grande at Del Norte where the river leaves the San Juan Mountains. We add to that inflows from the Gage Conejos River. We came up with an involved strategy to estimate other ungaged inflows to the river system. And we add all that together 
and we estimate for the Rio Grande at Lobatos for that year, what would have been the flows leaving the state of Colorado and entering the state of New Mexico if it weren't for irrigation in the San Luis Valley? In green for this particular year is the measured flows at Lobatos, and in black is what we're estimating. So now those results. We, we accepted the present flow regime of the river at Del Norte coming out of the San Juan Mountains as the natural supply to the upstream end of the river. If you look at those records coming out of the San Juan River, there has been a slow, persistent decrease in the total annual flow um, uh, from coming from the San Juan Mountains, declining at about 1,300 acre feet per year, no significant change in the average uh, flood flows, a decrease in the base flows since 1930. Um, that roughly coincides with the time series of the cycles of wet and dry periods that had been estimated by paleo flood hydrologic studies. And here is the uh, here is our finding. So let's just leave this up for a minute to digest this. This is the flow at Lobatos at the downstream end of the San Luis Valley. This red line is the average hydrology of the Rio Grande as it enters New Mexico. And in the gray shaded area, essentially is the interquartile range of estimated flows for every year. In other words, in 50% of all years, the hydrology of the flows is somewhere in this gray area. In blue is our estimate of what the flows coming into New Mexico would be in the absence of irrigation in the San Luis Valley. Similarly, this is the flow regime at Ottawa Bridge just downstream from the confluence with the Rio Conchos, I'm sorry, Rio, Con uh, Rio Chama, and this is the estimated natural flow and I would note that neither of these calculations involves any influence from the San Juan Chama Diversion Project. This is the hydrology at San Marcial as the flows enter Elephant Butte Reservoir. And this is the flow of the northern branch of the Rio Grande just upstream from Presidio. This red line is the average hydrology of the Rio Grande today. And this is the hydrology of what it would be in the absence of the massive consumptive uses of this river whose flow is nearly entirely consumed for agriculture and human, other human uses. If we look at the total annual flow as a simple diagram, this is what the natural flow regime of the Rio Grande would be in the absence of significant consumptive uh, uh, losses. Roughly 2 million acre feet of water per year coming out of the basin, each of these small Blue lines are the estimated ungauged tributary inputs. You can see that about 400,000 acre feet, no, um, 600, 640,000 acre feet of water coming out of the San, coming out of the San Juan Mountains, significant additions from the Conejos and the Rio Chama and that water continuing all the way downstream. <clears throat> Today's river average for the last 60 years is a very different river in which all of this water is consumed upstream and has little to do with the river downstream. 
approximately 95% of the water that would have entered the Rio Conchos is today consumed. The largest losses are in the San Luis Valley. The second largest losses are in the Mesilla Valley of southern New Mexico. The next largest losses are in the El Paso Juarez Valley. And the fourth largest losses are in central New Mexico. <coughs> it's beyond the scope of this talk for me to, to say, I, I will just say that we analyzed our estimated annual natural flow in every year of the century and compared our results with estimates by the NRCS and our results are in agreement with those data. What we are adding to the conversation is this very precise characterization of the entire flow regime. To put this into context, here is for another gauge, Rio Grande at San Felipe below Cochiti Dam, the natural flow regime in the absence of human impacts. And in black is the much heralded 2016 coordinated environmental release from Cochiti Dam for the benefit of the Rio Grande Silvery Minnow. It's a significant achievement to gain that flood in the context of the modern uses of the river. And it's a small reestablishment of a regime in relationship to the natural regime in which the ecosystem evolved. So the findings of our work are these. 95% of the natural runoff of the northern branch is consumptively used. Just for the stream flow coming out of the southern Rocky Mountains in the state of Colorado, 70% of the natural runoff is consumed. Today's spring snowmelt flood in central New Mexico is entirely over by mid-June. In the absence of the massive amount of irrigation upstream, the flood would take most of the summer to pass, and the base flows would be much larger throughout the summer. The magnitude of average spring floods is now more than 60% less than it once was. Once upon a time, the natural, flow, uh, natural snowmelt floods in central New Mexico always occurred in late May. Today, they erratically occur any time between late March and September, uh, very much changing the natural cues to the native ecosystem. And downstream from Elephant Butte Dam, there is no resemblance of the natural flow regime in the existing, uh, in the existing flow regime. And that is certainly the case where the river enters at Presidio with the Rio uh, uh, Conchos. The northern branch was once a significant contributor to the flow regime of the lower Rio Grande. That is no longer the case. Thus, Given the massive, the great dependence on water supply by human societies in both countries, we should be very careful in using the word restoration. Restoration of this natural flow regime is impossible. It would require essentially depopulating the watershed. Thus what we're really talking about is creating a novel and new hydrologic regime. Associated with that is the creation of a novel and new sediment supply regime because so much sediment is now trapped in the reservoirs of the system, which means that the channel form of the river today is completely novel and different from the, not, the form of the river in, uh, in the past. The challenge for us as we go forward is we have to decide what are the aspects of the existing novel aquatic and riparian ecosystems that we want and that we desire? And what kind of a novel flow regime do we need to create that novel ecosystem? It's not so simple as the going back to pristine nature 
in a sense, the scary thing is we almost have to play God here. We get to decide what we want, and we get to decide how to do it to create it. Sam, it's all yours. Um, and in this part, I would also like to um, acknowledge, um, um, I mean, the collaborative effort that we've been doing with Jack, also with Janet uh, and Pablo, who were the ones that did uh, a lot of this work, um, which is basically, so what Jack presented is the Northern branch, which is basically above Presidio, above Osinaga. Um, what um, we are going to be talking about is from Presidio uh, at La Junta de los Rios all the way down to the Gulf. So um, let's just, yeah, as we know, this is a, a very complex system, the Rio Grande, the Rio Bravo, the RGB. And basically what's, um, what I just want to highlight here is that, I mean, early, uh, and Jack was mentioning since the 1700s, 1600s, there were diversions. And then as uh, agreements were made, um, we, those agreements effectively start um, disconnecting hydrologically the basin. So those, this, is, this is just to show you what is the extent of all of those different agreements. And then here is just basically um, a lot of the different irrigation, irrigation districts, irrigation systems that are all over spread out throughout the, um, the basin. So as we can see here, there is, it is a basin that Time wise, because of the reservoir has been altered, but also in terms of quantity, um, that water mm. has been extracted. Uh, can, can everyone please mute themselves? Um, this is uh, again just to show how the different types of storages that are. Uh, I mean the historic storage uh, reservoirs and the total storage in the United States and Mexico and how that that was increased. I mean since the early 1900s. Um, at least in this, what it was called the um, uh, the Magic Valley, the Lower Rio Grande. I mean we we have estimates of what were some of the um, acres, hectares of um, agriculture already going on. Here in, in in the early 1900s, and a very few amount of water used on on the Mexican side. So um, um, we've been taking a look at this, and I think this is um, an uh, well the presentation that you're listening right now is an ongoing conversation that we have had in terms of um, identifying some of the environmental issues in in this part of the basin. Um, some of those related with um, giant cane and tamarix. Um, the um, the silvery minnow, the species that has been driven, a lot of the endangered species that has driven some of the conversation on how to how to think of the strategies. Those can be um, um, perhaps, uh, as Jack is mentioning, engineer with some help of uh, what were the the different um, flow elements that happen naturally in the basin. So. Um, you can see the degradation. This is in an early 1900 uh, picture where you can see a river that it was actually, it was wide and the, the, the bed was shallow. It didn't have that much vegetation in here. And you can see here a river that is now stranded, that it's been channelized with plenty of outer vegetation, non-native vegetation in the banks, a river that has been a, a, a armor. So how to how to improve the um, the river? Um, in general, our in, in our case and our overall goal has been to improve the environmental conditions. Um, this is kind of a professional goal, and in this case, for what we are presenting here is to determine the natural flow regime. In our case, for the southern branch of the Rio Grande Bravo, uh, and the idea behind this is that we can we can improve. The, the understanding of the hydrology and some of the ecosystem functions, some of the, how the ecosystem was responding to this, to this hydrology. Um, this, to me, this is a, a, a project, a work that is, to me, is foundational in terms of understanding what it was and, and, and to start asking the, to start asking or, or, or asking, start the conversations of what Jack mentioned, which is, 
about restoration, conservation, and how to improve the system with considering the natural flow world or not. I think this this is the, the type of research that will lead to those conversations. In terms of the natural flow regime, the, the, the main point here is that the flow regime not only provides you within a year, within a season, what is the seasonality of the natural flow, but also it can provide you some of the specific elements that happen within a year. And between many years, it can tell you how big were the droughts, how big were the flood years, and so on. So that's, that's what you're going to listen from us. In our case, we follow pretty much very similar methods of what, of what Jack is mentioning in terms of adding some of these unaccounted uh, gauges, um, uh, unaccounted tributaries by estimating the incremental flows, also by putting back the water that, that we know was recorded as diversions into the basin. It is, it is a, a process of naturalization, naturalizing the flows, but basically that's, that's what we did in, also in our analysis, doing a mass balance approach. Um, why we use some of these methods? In, in our specific case, we went back to um, some of the records that um, were published by the um, International Boundary Commission, um, which is basically before the 1944 treaty when it changes to International Boundary and Water Commission. And the idea of, of those uh, studies is that they provide some, some good insights in terms of, in this case, when I was the runoff of the river um, in conscious um, under present and future conditions, uh, some of the um, a, a different uh, agricultural areas in the Conchos, Salado, San Juan, Alamos, all, the, all those, those different tributaries. Um, what were the, the, the estimated um, uh, flows, uh, monthly flows in there? And also, uh, we were able to, to find out some of the uh, records um, uh, related to stream flow data throughout, throughout the basin. So as, as Jack mentioned, this is, this is the flow of the Rio Grande, the Rio Bravo, just above, above the Rio Conchos. As you can see, it is, it is a snowmelt driven, it is a snowmelt driven uh, river. The black line is the median line. And then in between those, the blue um, shaded area, is the 25th and the 75th percentile. So as you can see that it has a seasonality within the year, which that will be the black line, but there is some variation interannually between those um, uh, shaded blue area. Um, this is the Rio Conchos. This is, this is how the Rio Conchos look like um, without any disturbance um, at that point in time from 1901 to 1913. As you can see, this is a mostly monsoon driven river. When there is not that much flow before the monsoon, the hurricane season, and then having some responses here because of, of heavy storms. Um, basically, again, it was actually, it, it varies quite a lot from almost 20 uh, CMS cubic meters per second all the way to above sometimes 200, 200 CMS. So, just right below of this area is between below the La Junta de los Rios, below the confluence of the Rio Conchos and the Rio Bravo. This is how it looked like. A river that had a snowmelt driven signature and of course with a lot of variation. And here a river that was that had a monsoon driven signature. So this was a bimodal Sometimes you can see, well, a bimodal in terms of a snow melt and hurricane season, um, maybe a trimodal with some of these early storms coming in um, early in the, in the hurricane season. Um, again, this will be the snow melt signature. This will be from the Rio, well, this is from above Okinaga. This will be the signature from the Rio Conchos and the black line it will be the combined signature of the snow melt and monsoon driven. Um, this is this is how it looks again below Rio Conchos. This will be 
So this is below real conscious. And now notice that I have changed the uh, y axis all the way to 800 CMS. Now at line 3, those were now um, Amistad is a little bit of above Amistad uh, Reservoir. Now we still have the same signature, the same bimodal signature of a snow melt and hurricane season and some early storms at the beginning with um, some base flow either in, early, in winter, uh, spring, uh, late fall. Continue going down, this is again the Rio Grande bubble below Devils and again the two the two clear distinct signatures. Um, below Eagle Pass, as we're moving down, again we have still the two signatures. And now, as you're seeing, as we're getting down um, downstream, we start having also a lot more influence of small tributaries such as Alamito, Terlingua, uh, San Felipe, Devils, um, where we have this kind of flashiness. Um, uh, as a variation, an interannual variation um, in the flow regime. This is at, at Laredo, and basically this, again, we have a bimodal snowmelt-driven and monsoon-driven uh, regime. This is at Roma, and this is just right underneath the entrance of the Salado River, and you can see that here there is an important jump between this much water and here because of the Salado River, uh, coming in, and again, we have now a lot of interannual variability. This is driven mostly for um, uh, hurricane season. Um, and then finally, the bronze too. As you can see, in none of these um, slides I changed the y axis. Here it is um, now at the mouth of the river at bronze uh, This is a larger volume. Here, I just changed the axis and you can actually see again the, the hydrograph with a base flow pretty much from January all the way to April, um, May, and then it starts having still a, a snow melt signature on this part, a monsoon driven signature in this part, and now we're seeing sometimes medium flows of above 500 CFS here at the mouth of the river. Um, entering Laguna Madre all the way, all the way to the Gulf. Um, how does this look like? This is um, an estimation done from, as I was mentioning, uh, some of the records uh, when the treaty was signed. And uh, in red is the numbers that we estimated, and in black are the numbers estimated at that in 1946, in 1945, when the um, the treaty was ratified in both senates. And basically, I mean, for the conscious, we calibrate a model in a way that it actually um, gets closer to the average that these guys estimated. Um, for the four tributaries here, we estimate about uh, 322 million cubic meters, and um, this study estimated 480, 418. Um, and for Salado, we estimated above around 1100. The, that um, the study is the main 925. Um, in general, we are close in, in most of these in most of these values, and I can tell that also um, uh, Jack Schmidt estimated about 2,500 um, million cubic meters per year. When in this study it was estimated about 2,200, so it's close enough. The one that we're still missing is uh, the Pecos River. When we have, we are short about a million cubic meters. Just to give you an idea, the entire basin used to have 10 million cubic meters per year as an average. That was the, the total available water in the rivers. Uh, 2.2 above in the northern branch, um, 8 um, in the southern branch. And in this one, we're just missing uh, 1 uh, million cubic meters that we're working right now on the Pecos. Um, this is something also to, to talk about in terms of what Jack was mentioning. Um, typically, when, when we're talking about restorations or how to provide water, we, we do a lot of this. The, the main difference of what you're seeing right now between the Utah State Group, the Aggie team, Utah State Group, and us is that um, before used to be a lot of this analysis when you have this 
monthly median or average values estimated for the entire year. And then you, depending on those, you start thinking about restoration. And my point here is that those those are no longer valid. The difference is that Jack's research and our group research, Jack and Todd, and, and our group is, is doing is, um, this is a high resolution study that daily is providing uh, what were the different base flows in different parts of the year, how those things vary depending on some local uh, range, how high did it go, what was the interannual variability, what was daily, how it looked like, compared to just these median um, averages that are that are here. This will be the same for, for the real conscious. You can see that um, we are providing a high resolution picture of, of what is going on from the headwaters in the San Juan mountain all the way down to the Gulf of Mexico. Um, this will be for both uh, below. Um, this will be all the way to Brownsville. You can see um, the high resolution that we're providing in terms of, of quality of data. And this, this one will go back to what I was mentioning. We'll, the, the river used to, used to be a restless river. It used to be a river with a two distinct signatures of a snow melt and monsoon season that carried a lot of sediment that it used to inundate floodplains every year and so on. And, and we don't have that river anymore. We have had use as a as, as society. We have used the, the amount of water that is there. And, and, and of course, some of the questions will be how to, how to improve the, the ecosystem there. Perhaps we can use some of the ideas, borrow some of the ideas from the natural flow. Perhaps we'll have to re-engineer it. Um, but that's, that's, that's for, for what this um, foundational knowledge is trying to, to lead us. What, what can we do? This is, I haven't done the, we haven't done the, the entire um, uh, study as Jack did. Compare at every point, how does it look like the natural flow and the, and the now altered, impaired flow. But at least in this point, uh, just, um, this, this may be Johnson Ranch. Um, this is the flow estimated, the natural flow estimated from 1901 to 1913, again, with the two distinctive um, signatures. This is the flow regime from 1920 to 2009, right here. It is literally, it is a flat line when we have some early releases for flood control, some program releases for flood control to do not in the inundate Okinawa Presidio. Every now and then a, a big hurricane is able to escape from Vizela Leon Reservoir and pass through this portion. But what is what is true is that this this is what is now. This is what used to be. Um, so on on our side, what what I would like to also highlight is that um, this this will be in I would say 2009. Uh, we had a, a a conference back in in Alpine, Texas. And at that point, when we were trying to come up with some good ideas and the understanding of the basin, um, at that point we start dreaming about, I mean, what was the, the hydrologic signature, the flow regime signature of the basin? Now, um, some years later, now we know it. Um, that that was that that's been a, a a long work and a lot of patience and putting all the pieces together. Um, the other one with that is um, not only uh, to estimate or create this foundational knowledge. What is what are the specific opportunities that we can find within the basin to to start improving the environmental um, state in the basin, the aquatic. And repairing ecosystems in the in, in the along the the river corridor, and some of those may be through um, reparation of infrastructure. Some of those might be through water conservation. Some of those will be through different or other different alternatives. And, and again, going back to what Jack is mentioning, 
now we know how the river used to look like. And it looks very different of what it looks right now. Um, yet we, 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 we have the opportunity to improve it. So this, the, the, the rationale behind this on our side was to, to provide this foundation and knowledge and to start a conversation. How, how can we move forward? Um, what, what is the river that we want? And, and how can we start thinking about reoperating, looking for opportunities to, to make it happen? So that's, that's on our side for, for us. Thank you. And, and, and Jack for a great presentation. I'm going to um, go ahead and unmute everyone. Um, if, if you have any, in case you have any questions, um, but if you're not speaking, if you could uh, please mute yourself so there's no interference, that would be great. Um, so. Um, any questions, this is Mike Langston. Any questions for either Sam or Jack? Yeah, I do have a question. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Go ahead, caller. Yeah, this is Tom Vaughn in Laredo. Uh, does anybody have any good data on the history of the invasion of Donax on the Rio Grande? Um. I, uh, this is Jack, I, uh, I've not put that, I don't have that story together. Um, yeah, I don't know that story. Sam? <laughs> no, I don't, no, I, I don't have maybe idea where, where can we get that? Well, I have I have no idea. I mean, I've tried to look at you know, try to find as old of photographs as I could up and down the river and and uh, look in archives and so forth. But I don't find any real discussion on when Brundo you know took over and if it came from you know like the El Paso area down or if it came from the valley up or if it came in from uh, rivers in Mexico into the Rio Grande uh, when I look at you know Laredo pictures okay pretty 1954 flood see anything okay um, let's let's uh, move on see if we can get some other questions any, any other questions from any other callers uh, hello, this is Dagmar Llewellyn from Albuquerque. Uh, um, I'd like to know if you actually created a um, a year by year naturalized uh, hydrograph. Yes, yes. Um, and and if that data set is available for, um, we're, we're looking for something like that to use in in a project trying to improve our forecasting. Yeah, let, let me. Uh, let me try to explain um, quickly what Todd did. Todd has looked at every gauging record that exists uh, for the northern branch uh, for the century. And um, so therefore, based on the losses between gauges in every day for every year, uh, we have, he has estimated what would be the natural flow of the river in every year at every gauge. That's an overwhelming amount of data to supply in a talk. Therefore, we just sought to show in this talk the average hydrographs. But to calculate those gray um, hydrographs which I showed, that's 50% of the years, and embedded in that, uh, you know, behind that is the actual precise estimate for every year. And just to be clear, our estimates, uh, slightly different from Sam's approach, but they're both comparable, 
is um, our estimates are what would the natural flow have been in 1955 or 1985 had there been no irrigation losses? So um, that's how we did that. We just subtracted them out. So it's an immense amount of data, and we'd be happy to talk with your group and collaborate with you. Uh, our work will be all part of a final report to the USGS. It's all publicly available data. At this point, we've submitted a journal article for review, and we're in that process. Okay, so I, I would like to talk to you about potentially sharing that the that data set, that hydrology. And you know, and we could talk with my colleagues at the at National Center for Atmospheric Research in Boulder, who I'm working on this with. Yeah, and and I think uh, we have the same, and and I think Jack, at some point, it will be nice if we can. I mean, for the sake of um, simplicity, we can put all of both your data and our data in one place. So again, this is not um, separated here and there um, for the sake of the scientific community. Thank you both. A any other questions? Yes, there's one question from Steve. I'll read it out loud. He's asking, were you able to disassociate groundwater flow from these stream flows? Or in other words, what's the contribution to stream flow in the RG from groundwater? Uh, we did not, our group did not specific, specifically address that at all. We simply looked at the gains and losses between gauging stations as reflected in the surface water record. The proportion of the increase that comes by surface water flow from ungaged tributaries as opposed to from base flow contributions from the alluvial aquifers, we have not evaluated. We might be smart enough to figure out how to do that, but we've not done that yet. Yeah, and, and in, in my case, it's the same. I mean, we, we, we didn't separate it, but uh, uh, I can tell you that there is a uh, a very clear distinction between um, above Amistad and all those different um, um, inflows from the aquifers to the main stem. And as you're heading down below Laredo, all those different losses from the river into the aquifer. So in our case, we didn't estimate it per se, but, but we have an idea how, how the um, the, the system is responding in terms of surface water, groundwater interaction, which which is already very well known on that portion of the of the basin. I have a question. So perhaps we can go ahead. Oh uh, yeah, this is Paul Tashin from Albuquerque. So have there's have you made any estimates of the bed load size in this natural hydrograph? Uh, through the Big Bend range in particular, in terms of uh, sand versus what's out there today, and what the size would have been in distribution of bed load historically? Uh, this is Jack. Um, Sam has uh, estimated the natural flow regime. Uh, my research group, uh, collaboration of myself and my former student, Dave Dean, and all the wonderful contributions by the Grand Canyon Monitoring and Research Center. Um, we certainly have a very good handle on the present geomorphology of the river, bed grain sizes, suspended sediment transport, all of that. Um, we, you know, to tell you the truth, it's a big mental, um, exploration to try to think about the implications of this massive change in the hydrology to the what the implications to the geomorphology of the river because the capacity what we know today is that the river has been perturbed into sediment surplus everywhere the rivers are grading and accumulate sediment all the time the only time sediment significantly moves down to Amistad reservoir 
is during the occasional hurricane flood once a decade. Um, but I would, my hunch is that with this massive amount of water that now, that used to be in the system, it's uh, highly likely that that stuff flushed right on through. Uh, we know by Friedman's, um, no, by what? What is that book? Restless River. Um, Mueller. Um, Mueller's book that the river was, you know, really quite geomorphically active. Um, we have so we have good historical accounts. The details of the bed load, the details of how things work. I think we've told a very tight story for the Big Bend region. And Mueller's book, Restless River, tells a wonderful story as well. I don't know that we can do any better than that. We're gradually putting that story together now for Central New Mexico. A uh, research group at University of New Mexico has contributed to that, and we've written about some of that as well. But it's, a, it's a, quite a perplexing problem. And I think it really does cycle also back to the condition of the native ecosystem, why there aren't cottonwood trees along lots of the river. You know, this river has profoundly changed 150 years ago. Thank you. Yeah, the silvery minnow definitely, you know, it's very thin bed up here. It's a very thin bed fish. So I'm just wondering about the effort to try to restore the silvery minnow through Big Bend and some of the issues with the with bed loads with that. But thanks. Uh, Phaedra Booty, who is part of the Utah State team working on uh, on uh, the ecology of the river, uh, some someday I get she'll, you'll hear from her. Um, they are looking at the substrate conditions and the nature of the aquatic ecosystem in Big Bend. And that work tied in with this work we described today, uh, I think will give us some insights into that. Thank you. Okay, we have time for one quick question. Okay, Seth is asking what method was used to obtain on-gauge flow? Mm -hmm. Um, would to estim estimate ungauged flows, Todd looked at the downs, compared the downstream gauge to the upstream gauge, mm -hmm. and uh, for any day of any year, when the downstream gauge uh, had higher flows than the estimated incoming uh, supply from all the upstream gauges, that's what we took as the ungauged inflows. Mm -hmm. In any day of any year which the downstream flow was less than the upstream flow, we just assumed the upstream flows of all the gauges upstream passed downstream. So mm -hmm. our estimates are in fact a conservative estimate based only on measured data. Yeah, we, we follow okay. the same procedure. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you all for joining us. Again, thank you to our presenters today and their two very capable graduate students. Um, Sarah, will this uh, uh, webinar be recorded and available to folks in the near future? Yes. Okay. We will send out an email to the list to let everybody know where to um, find that. And if you need to get a hold of either of the speakers, you can contact Sarah or you can contact me, Mike Langston, at the USGS. Thank you again for joining us. And our next webinar is when, Sarah? Um. I caught her off guard. Yeah, I'll, Sorry I'll about that, that, Sarah. I'll send out an email um, with the information. Okay. Uh, yes. I believe it's next week. Yes. Um, okay. Thank you all for joining us. Thanks, everybody. Bye -bye.
Thank, Thank you, you, everyone.